Hello, and welcome to Jason Cabinets Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinets. Our guest today is Dr. Dr. Quentin Morris. Dr. Morris, you ready to be great today? Ready to be great. Dr. Quentin Morris enjoys a multifaceted career as a concert violinist, educator, entrepreneur, and filmmaker. He is a founder of Kita Change, a nonprofit with the mission of inspiring underserved youth and students of color through world class instruction and supporting the development of software work leaders. Kita Change operates two violin and viola studios in South King County, Washington, where serve middle school and high school students who may not otherwise have access to, class to classical music instruction. Dr. Morris, thank you for being here today. I really appreciate thank it. Thank you for having me. So, Dr. Morris, what is viola? Uh, viola. Viola, viola. Um, viola is an instrument that looks very much like a violin. It's just a little bit larger, but it has a deeper, um, kind of darker, lower tone. So it shares three um, strings along with the violin, A, D, and G, but the viola has a lower string, C, where the violin has a higher string, E. So um, they're definitely very much related. It's just the viola, again, has a lower sound. So talk about key to change. What is, what is that? That's your passion right now. Can you talk yeah. a little bit about that. Key to change is a nonprofit organization I founded three and a half years ago, and our mission is to inspire underserved uh, youth through world class music instruction and support their development as self aware leaders. And so essentially, what we do is we provide violin and viola lessons to middle and high school students who live in the South King County area. Um, students who live in, the, in those areas who are in middle or high school have an opportunity to come and take lessons with myself and a colleague um, where they, take, they, they get lessons twice a week. And uh, we also bring in guest artists who serve as professional violinists or um, professors at renowned institutions. We also do um, a college prep workshop every year for students, and um, we have really um, great mentorship for all of our kids where we help them um, just kind of stay on the right path of, of being positive and, and being leaders at their schools and in their communities. So how, when did this idea come to you? Was it a recent idea? Has that always been like in your back of your mind to do something like this? This idea came to me about four years ago I did a world tour called Breakthrough, where I literally went around the globe performing and teaching in a lot of different underserved areas. And in all the different communities that I went to, I was so inspired by the youth there. And I noticed a lot of different commonalities of, of the students that I met from France to being in Tanzania to being in China, they all shared a lot of the same kind of, of um, just kind of the same characteristics. They all were very passionate about learning and having fun. They just didn't have a lot of the resources that were needed in order to have the best education. And so I started thinking and reflecting back on my own childhood and how there was such a, a lack of resources for me when I was a student. So I decided that um, I wanted to create a program where I could give those resources to students and really um, give them a high level of music instruction that would inspire them. And so that was essentially how Key to Change came, was through the inspiration of my world tour. And so across the world, music is music, right? Oh, yeah. It doesn't matter. I, I mean, mean, they call it the universal language, right? It is because, I mean, when you're not able to communicate verbally, you're able to communicate orally or instrumentally through music. Can you talk more about your Breakthrough War Tour? Sure. Uh, <laughs> Breakthrough World Tour was a two-year uh, enterprise that I uh, embarked upon. It actually... Um, it's kind of weird how it happened. I was um, doing concerts regularly um, every year, in fact, at Carnegie Hall. And I really enjoyed my time there. And um, 
and and I was I was going there um, every year for for about a period of three years. And at the end of my third run there, um, I just got to thinking about like there's something else that I want to do. Like there's you know there's other things that I want to do. I've always been passionate about film, you know, entrepreneurship and and looking for ways to just kind of expand my creativity and innovation. And I had always wanted to do a world tour and, uh, but never really had the opportunity to. And so um, I had this radical idea to put it together, which is what I did. And I had a, um, a small team of people who helped me and literally, you know, toured and we did our own bookings and, um, and we produced a film and a, a CD project from it. And it was, it was very successful. So was it easier or harder coming from your background? Like you, you, you know, you played at Carnegie Hall. Did it make it easier to book concerts and book dates versus being like, like maybe someone wasn't like so? You'd be surprised. Um, you would think, oh, you know, everyone would just come knocking. And I, I mean, I think it certainly helped. But in the grand scheme of things, it, it was still tough, you know, you're dealing with management in, in, in Africa versus dealing with management in France or in Australia or in China, or, you know, in, in, or Malaysia. Like, it, it was a lot to juggle as far as dealing with all the different cultures and, and their way of how they did business and, um, and, and kind of getting a crash course in international relations and um, so that part was, I think, a little bit challenging, but um, we were very successful. I, I, you know, performed at the Louvre Museum and was able to also give a talk and show my film there. Um, I did some work for the U.S. Embassy while I was in Australia. Um, my my first run in Australia went, was so successful that I went for the second year. So I went twice during the world tour to Australia, which was great. and. I had an opportunity to teach and perform at the Sydney Opera House. So, I mean, there were definitely some respected venues that I was able to play at that, you know, I, I think the average musician doesn't get to perform there, at least the average classical musician doesn't get to perform there. So I was very thankful to, you know, be able to do those things. Can someone learn to be creative or are you just born with it? Mm, that's a great question. You know, I don't really know the answer to that because I've always been creative. So I think from my personal view, I think it's something you're born, born with. with. Yeah, I think the same way. Yeah. I, I think you're born with it. However, I do think that people, I think there's there's kind of the intangible characteristic that people have of being creative. However, I think that there are skills that one may possess that can enable them to have creative characteristics. Um, but I think there's definitely a difference between those who look at processes or look at relationships or look at projects from just a creative mindset versus those people who may not be as quote creative, but um, they're able to be somewhat innovative through um, whatever it is that they're trying to <laughs> create um, that can, can give the perception that they're creative. In, the In other words, yeah. it's, it's not something for some people, I think it's organic and it's very natural. And for other people, I don't think it is. If that makes sense. It makes a lot of sense. I think one problem we have in the world, I think too many people are like, you know, I'm a business person. I'm not creative. I'm creative. I'm not a business person. It's like, it was like this conflict, you know, you can't, if you're a creative person, you can't be a business person, you know? Yeah, I don't believe in that. I believe that some of the most successful businesses were those that were creative. And, and I think at, the, at the, the core of what creativity is, is um, being able to provide value to other people, which again is that's a great. That's, I like that definition. That's a great definition. Yeah, being creative is 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 creating is um, the service of value to others. That's what creativity is. Do you think artists should be true to themselves and, and and just create what they want to create, 
or if they create what they think their customers want? I think that artists do both. And I think entrepreneurs do both. I mean, really, when you're talking about value, it's the value of giving people, you know, what they need. Sometimes the customer doesn't know what they need. They don't know. I mean, if you think about um, the internet, when the internet first came out, it, I mean, it was like this thing, this very foreign, you know, thing. And uh, we as the public, the customer, we didn't know that we needed it, but those who created it knew that. Yeah, and the I one think who created it had the vision for it. Absolutely. And so I think that when you're talking about business, entrepreneurship, artistry, whatever, sometimes your job is to create things that add value and are that are going to provide tremendous value to people and, and help their lives be better. They may not know it, but you know it. And that's where it's your responsibility to um, to follow through on those things. Yes. You talk about a little bit, but that you did a short film mm -hmm. for your breakthrough concert, breakthrough world tour. tour. Yeah. 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 What was that about? How did that come out? Was it just a film of like the actual concert series? Or? No, it wasn't. It was actually on a composer. So the, the um, breakthrough world tour, originally what I was supposed to do was tour with an album. That's what generally most classical artists do. You know, they release an album, they do a tour. Did a lot have, of artists do that did too. Did you have a sponsor for your tour? I had a couple sponsors, okay. yeah, yeah. Um, but I went into the studio to record the album and I had this, I have no idea why I thought that I would be able to finish my whole album in three days, but I only had three days and I wasn't able to finish the album. And so the music, I, I was recording the music of the Chevalier de Saint-Georges, who was an African French composer who lived during the 18th century, early 18th century. And he um, was, he's credited as the first composer of black descent to have a major career as a concert violinist and composer. He was also an incredible athlete. He was a world renowned swordsman, a fencer, and everyone knew it. And um, so I was recording his music. Well, three days passed and I wasn't able to, um, finished the album and and actually our our friend alex diaz i was talking to him about it and freaked out because i had two investors who gave me the money for this album so that i could tour um the world with it and oh my gosh i i re i still remember having the pit in my stomach and thinking oh my god i haven't finished this album what am i going to do what am i going to tell my investors and so I, I was at happy hour with two friends and I was telling them about it. And um, I had the concept that I would do a documentary film. And my friend said, well, I mean, why don't you, instead of doing a film, a, a documentary, you could just use the music that you, you've recorded like as a soundtrack. And I thought that'd be cool. And then I got to thinking, like, well, what if I actually told the story of Chevalier de Saint George, but in a way that the the everyday person could relate to? So instead of doing this documentary, which has already been done, why don't I create a short film that's slick, sexy, that's going to appeal to a younger audience? It's going to appeal to people who don't know anything about classical music. And so I looked back at my paper that I wrote. Um, during my doctorate, which I wrote on him, and basically turned that into a screenplay. And um, the rest is history. And so as I was putting together and planning the world tour, the film just kind of organically took shape. And the world tour wound up being much more bigger and more interesting than I could have ever imagined. And I think that's what real artists do they things get created and and things kind of morph as you're in the midst of the project i think it's the same with entrepreneurs or businessmen you 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 beta test it you see what works what doesn't work well the album 
was not working for me. I was supposed to be thinking bigger. And that was where the film came in. Um, at your school, how much time do you spend with your students making sure they know the history of the, of the past people who, who like... The school, like... Yeah, key, my, to change, key to change. Key to change? You know, we do talk about the um, history of... of um, we do talk about the, the history behind the composers because, I mean, understanding the, uh, the um, nuances of who these people were, they, they lived just like you and I, they had lives, you know, they paid bills, they had taxes, they, they, they had sex, they, they drank, they, they had affairs, they, you know, they got into the, to, you know, conflicts with other people. Like they, they were people, and I think sometimes we look at composers, especially of classical music, as if they were like Greek gods. Like, yeah, did yeah. they really yeah. actually exist? But they do exist. And, and so that was the point of breakthrough, was to actually tell who we are and, and who, um, you know, who this, these composers are. So we do talk a lot about that. We do talk about the nuances of composers and, and, and what they're doing in their lives. Do, I gotta make sure I always say this right, do certain countries have a monopoly on great music talent? Do certain countries have a monopoly on, on great great monopoly music talent? On great talent? I, I don't I don't think I know the answer to that. I, I'm going to say no. Well, yeah. I mean, talent is somewhat relative, right? Yeah. So I'm going to say no to that because in one, one part of my brain is saying, well, yeah, because of resources, right? Mm -hmm. Like, but is your talent really based off of resources? Yes and no. I mean, if you take lessons, you can be talented at something. And if you take lessons, then, of course, that enhances your talent and gives you additional skill to be better. So that left part of my brain says, yes, yes, because of resources and lack of resources for people in various countries who may be very talented but don't have the the capacity or the resources to enhance their talent, i.e. key to change. That's why it was created, right? But then on the other hand, I mean, talent is, again, somewhat like what we were talking about earlier um, about, about creativity. Um, talent, I believe, is something that you're born with. I think we're all naturally talented and gifted at something. And so, you know, I remember when I was in Tanzania, there was a man um, who played two flutes and he played them through his nostrils. And it was the most amazing thing I had ever seen in my life. Um, a man playing two different wooden flutes through his nostrils. I was like, just amazed by that, you know? Um, did he ever have any formal lessons? Probably not. I don't know anyone who plays a flute anywhere in the world through their nose, let alone two, you know, through their nostrils. Like, I'm just thinking, of, like, how do you breathe through one, you know what I mean? Like. But it was amazing to me. And that man was talented. So does he need a lot of resources in order for him to continue his talent? I don't know, <laughs> you know? Yeah, so uh, I, I think a lot of athletes have like what I think about hand-eye coordination. Do you need like something like hand-eye coordination to be a musician? Yeah, of course you do. I mean, and in the case of this guy who's playing two flutes, I mean, you need nostril coordination. Yeah nostril mouth eye coordination I, I i i still when i think about that i'm like how did that man do that so when did you first become interested in being a classic musician was it like since you're a little kid a lifelong dream just was day? not a lifelong dream i wanted to become a attorney 
Um, I was so inspired by um, Blair Underwood's character on L.A. Law. I remember that character. You remember that? Yeah, in the early 90s. And um, I was so inspired by that show. And that's that was my role model, was Blair Underwood and seeing him. And um, But I wound up going off to school. I went to Xavier University, which is a historically black college, and um, really fell in love with the violin there. Um, was that the first place you ever played the violin? No, I had played violin all through, from elementary school through high school. Um, but I didn't really know that there was any, um, I didn't, I didn't know about the resources that were available to me. I didn't at that time. And so it wasn't until I got to Xavier in New Orleans that I actually um, had a violin professor who was black and looked like me. She played in the, the Louisiana Philharmonic and just had an, a tremendous impact on me and an inspiration to me and um, that I thought, okay, maybe I could do that. Cause I thought her career was so cool. Uh, I, she was just playing in the orchestra and she comes from a family of jazz musicians. And, um, and I thought, wow, I, I could do that, you know? So um, that was kind of the inspiration. So for, for audience who might not know what an HBCU is, can you explain what that is? And just talk about your, your, your general um, experience at Xavier? Sure. Uh, an HBCU is, uh, stands for Historically Black College or University. Um, I went to one in New Orleans at Xavier University. It was great. I, I had a great experience. Um, I felt like I was surrounded by people not only who looked like me, but um, who thought a lot like me, who were striving to be the best that they could be in their craft. I mean, you know, you're going to a school. I mean, I think Xavier was like 4,000 students or something like that. And everyone was so smart and intelligent and bright and competitive and beautiful. And I was like, Oh my God, like I was just transformed. It, it was an incredible experience being around so many people who just were extremely passionate about so many different things. So correct me if I'm wrong, but the HBC was started back in the day because people of color were not allowed to go to the white schools, correct? Correct. And in the case of Xavier University, <laughs> You're testing my 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 history. Um, gosh, Xavier University, ooh, founded in 1841, ooh, I think. Um, but it was founded by Mother Catherine Drexel. Well, now she's a saint. She's she's um, got uh, her sainthood ten years ago or so. But um, Catherine Drexel was a nun, and she was. Um, a woman who was part of the Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament. And um, these, these nuns believed in providing um, resources for Black and American Indian people. And so if I remember correctly, Catherine Drexel started Xavier University and then also started a number of other schools in Louisiana for Black and American Indian students. So she definitely made an impact on a lot of people's lives. She impacted a lot of people's lives. And this was a white woman who did this. But she was part of, of this... Um, I don't want to call it a sorority because they were all nuns, but I don't know the correct terminology for it. But these nuns all were very, um, they were deeply religious, but they were also deeply um, impacted by um, the racism that was going on in the country. And they were determined to provide a better life for people. And this woman 
is a saint, literally now, but she, she, she helped so many Black and American Indian families and people. So let's say suppose a person of color that is trying to go to college. What advice do you tell them to like, I think it's called a predominantly white college or HBCU. What's the pros and cons or does it matter? Each situation is different. Each situation is different. I know for myself, you know, I wanted to go to a historically black college. Um, again, I was inspired by the role models that I saw on television. So different, a different world, which was, Directed by Debbie Allen during that time. It, it Hillman was, College. It was, it was Hillman College. Hillman, Hillman College. Hillman, yeah. yeah, yeah. But it was it was based off of, I think Howard University or one of those schools. Yeah. Um, I mean, it was that's what I grew up watching, and so I saw people on TV who looked like me, and I aspired to be just like them, and uh, and the other people who were in my class. There were only maybe four or five black students in you know the classes because i took mostly honors classes when i was in high school and so you know we kind of formed a bond and we all decided we wanted to go to historically black colleges as a matter of fact most of us did um that's all we applied to were historically black colleges but i think to answer your question i think it depends on the person I think it depends on exactly what it is that they are trying to accomplish, what, what type of experience they want. I wanted a black experience at that time. At 18 years old, I wanted to be around intelligent, forward-thinking, progressive um, black people who looked like me. And where did you go to high school at? Where did you graduate high school at? I went to Renton High. Okay. Yeah, Up class 96. The yeah, yeah. In, in South King County. And so I, I wanted that experience. And so I think for parents or for, um, for students who are trying to decide what they want to do, I think it's, it's really about the experience. I went for the, I went for the experience. Um, and, and I'm glad I did. I, I was there for three years and, and I felt like that was enough um, for me. Uh, because once I identified that I wanted to do music, which is not uh, classical music, is not dominated by, uh, it's not largely dominated by, by uh, Blacks, um, I knew that, that I needed to change um, my focus and I needed to recalibrate, and that meant leaving Xavier University and going to a conservatory. Yeah, one thing I think is pretty cool. I don't know how to reach the kind of the subject, but like I think the top one of the top twenty basketball players, high school basketball players, decided to go to Howard. Like he turned he turned down Duke, North Carolina, mm -hmm. and people were like, "What are you doing?" He's like, "I want to go to HBC. I want to get experience, right?" And people That's like, right. thinking, "No, is this gonna be a sea change? Like you know, black athletes leaving you know the PWI schools and going like back to HBCUs?" You know. Well, you know, I loved my time at Xavier. It it was. It was very difficult for me to leave. It was tough, but there was like this little voice on the inside of me that said, you gotta go now. It was, and it was so strong because I was having a great time. All my friends were there. Um, I had, you know, I had a family of support of, of people who, um, are still friends of mine till this day. It was, it was very difficult for me to leave, but I knew that if I wanted to have a career in classical music, I had to go. So I'm gonna guess it's pretty rare to be a classical musician nowadays, right? It's not like a like everyday thing, right? Um, I mean- Like the population is pretty small, I would think. I, yeah, I mean, it's relatively small compared to an NBA player. Yeah. Or, 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 but I mean, when you look at NBA or, or NFL players, yeah, it's kind of the same thing, right? Pretty, yeah. Like you don't, you don't walk around saying, Oh yeah, I know Tom Brady and I know, you know, Deion branch and I know, you know, Russell Wilson. Like I would, I would put classical music in, 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 it's an elite sport. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's a, it's an elite artistic sport. So yeah, you you chances are you probably don't know 
you know, a classical yeah. musician like you wouldn't know an NFL yeah. or a or a um, professional basketball player. Um, so I put it in in that realm. And so take a step further. With you being a black a class musician, that has to be even a smaller demographic, right? Definitely smaller. <laughs> and so how do how do the workers like you know looking for people like you said look like you to be your mentors? How does that work out for you? Well, you have to search for it. You know, when I was coming through school and um, at the very early part of my career, there were really just a handful of us and we all knew each other. Now, of course, you know, things are changing. It's still relatively small, but the pool of, of talented black musicians, classical musicians is definitely widening and deepening. And you're seeing more people who are, um, who have a platform either through social media, they're winning orchestra jobs, they're winning um, college professorships, um, they're out there, they're touring, they're performing. Um, so it, it, it's definitely changed than when I was a student, you know, coming up. That's a good point. How has the, the, the social media changed, you know, classic music? How's that changed? Like people getting jobs, putting themselves out there? How's that been well, I think it's negative. definitely bringing much more awareness. It's bringing more awareness to not only just who classical, black classical musicians are, but I think it's also um, highlighting and giving people a platform to be able to voice um, their concerns or, or voice um, their feelings around, you know, things such as Black Lives Matter or, or the injustices or racism that is within classical music. You know, I, I think that that has been a really great platform. Um, social media has been an excellent platform for people to just be engaged or be informed or voice their opinions or all the above. So how is it important for like um, young kids to be exposed to arts, classic music, culture at a young age? I mean, you're a parent. What, what do you think? I think it's very important. I think it's, I think it's part of a well rounded education. Yeah, but exactly. Exactly. I mean, music, most people forget that music is one of the seven liberal arts. So along with arithmetic and geometry and, and um, philosophy and, you know, music is the seven, seven liberal art. Most people forget that. It's technically not a performing art. Of course, we have kind of socialized that into, yes, it's a performing art, or some people think it's a fine art, but fine art is visual. Performing art is theater. Music is liberal. Okay, I did not know that. Yeah, that is your professorial historic moment for today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it is. It's, it's, um, of course, it's a performing art, but the but the the ground basis of why music was created and, and performed was it's a liberal art, and it's something that all of the great philosophers they did. Einstein played the violin, Pluto, and you know Aristotle. Like they all like had this enormous respect for quote the art form of music because music is theoretical it's mathematical it is creative it's artistic it's all of these things and you learn so many skills um, that are both tangible and intangible um, by studying an instrument so I think one I think one part you do at your school I think you 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 show kids how to be confident themselves right mm -hmm. what's important is showing kids to be confident in themselves and how do you go about doing that? Well, I think one thing that we work really hard on with our students is just getting them to understand the value of who they are and getting them to understand the power of their own voice. That's really important for young people. Why do you think young people, just people in general, it doesn't matter their age, are, are so scared to be confident or like don't believe their own voice? Is this like how they brought up or like the society pressures? Like, I think all of the above. But I do think it starts at home. I really do. I, I think that um, your 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 environment when you're young uh, is is crucial. I grew up 
in a household where we didn't have a lot of money or a lot of resources, but my mom, you know, made sure to, you know, let me know that I was loved and I was cared for and that, um, that I could do anything if I put my mind to it. Yeah, and, and unfortunately, so many homes don't have that, unfortunately, you mm-hmm, know. Mm-hmm. My mom um, really made sure that I knew that I was somebody and that I was special. Um, and so that's what we do it, it, with Key to Change is we let students know, hey, you're special and you've, you've got some authority over your life. And, and how you do that is how you practice how you perform in school, how you treat others. You, you have much more authority than you think you have. Um, but it's all in how you treat people and how you treat yourself, more importantly. Um, and, and so we talk a lot about that in our studio. I think one thing you do too, and like, like I think a lot of kids growing up, they think, oh, my, my whole is this two block area, right? I, I only live in Renton, I only live like one town. I think by going to music, it opens up a whole new world for them, right? It opens up new opportunities and new new things, then a new new vision for them, right? Yeah, yeah. I I think exposing young people to to as many possibilities of what they can become is is great. It's liberating. So you've had a very a great career, distinguished career. Why is it so important for you to come back home and, and give it back to your community? Uh, I think one of the reasons why it's so important for me to give back, especially now, is um, I'm in a position to be able to do so. Um, and, you know, I think also it's, it's my life's work. It's what I'm supposed to be doing right now in my life is giving back. And this organization enables me to be able to do that. For the key change, is there a minimum skill level somebody has to have to apply or? Nope, you just have to be in sixth grade. Okay. We don't do fifth or fourth or third, gotta be in sixth grade. So sixth grade is your target demographic? Mm -hmm. Sixth grade and up. And it's, uh, they have to be in school in written or what's the? They have to be in school in South King County. Okay. So we'll take students as far as Enum call. You know, and everything's digital right now anyway, so. Yeah. Um, so thinking of digital, how has the COVID affected your school? What changes have you made or had to make in force to make? We had to make a lot of change. We, we had to make some changes. I won't say a lot, but we had to make some changes. But, you know, it, it's, it's not what happens to you. It's how you respond. Mm-hmm. And we responded diligently and we responded thoroughly and carefully. Um, so we're we're doing actually just fine and all of our students are still getting served all of our lessons are online and the engagement has gone like way up and that's surprising actually to me anyway why it's not like we more engaged like one-on-one instructions like on like in in person to me okay why there's more hands-on you know more what's hands-on that's a good point See what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, the community is the people, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So regardless of if we're in person or online, that culture of community should not change. Like, for instance, Christians always say, the church is not the building, mm-hmm. it's the people, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Same thing with the organization. Yeah, we're not in person and I can't physically touch you or you can't touch me and we can't feel each other's technically energy, but the community of what has been created through Key to Change shouldn't change just because we're on, uh, we're online now. And I feel like with business, even like, I feel like this is a great opportunity for entrepreneurs to really flex and and to show who they are and what they're made of. For me, I've been waiting for this opportunity, not necessarily with COVID, Mm -hmm. but I've been waiting for this opportunity to really show what I can do. And I think 
through key to change and through the pandemic, we responded in a huge way. And so everything with key to change went way up, like 90% perfect attendance, 95% uh, higher productivity, 98% of our students uh, said that they feel like they've made significant progress on their instrument. That's great. So if you remember back in March and in April, the governor closed school for a month. So students, you know, after about a week or two, were bored. They didn't have anything to do. We didn't close down for one week. We kept right on going. We moved, we converted everything quickly to online. So before COVID hit, did you always have this plenty of back in mind to go remote or you just or you just kind of react? We've to always it? taught remote. Like if I was out of town or out of the country, then I would, you know, um, listen to students or hear them play or we, ha we incorporate a lot of technology into our program too. So students, you know, record themselves and they make videos and they send them in and I listen to them and watch them. And so, you know, that sort of stuff has always happened. Well, when, you, when you're teaching your students, is there like a perfect uh, student teacher ratio? Like you prefer like teach 10 or less, 20 or less one time, or does that number really matter? I mean, right now our classes have been really small. So the largest class I would say is like eight. So, you know, I think at one time we've maybe had, no, oh, we've had like 15, 16 kids in a class at one time. But again, it's all about the culture. And so, you know, our culture is, is really positive and really strong. So um, I think we've been, we've been fine on that. So for your students in, in the key to chain, is the goal for them to, to just get, get better at what they're doing? Is the, is the goal like, you know, helping them get musical scholarships or just making better people or? or I think it, it's very individual. Some students come into key to change because they want to get better as a violinist. Some kids come into key to change because they're just curious. They have no idea. And most of our kids, when they come and sign up for lessons, they have no idea really what they're signing up for. Um, but some of them come in because they, um, they want the community aspect or the social aspect. They want to meet other kids who are like them. They, you know, or, or they, um, they want to study with a black teacher, you know, especially my black students who've never had a black teacher before. When their parents see me, they're like, I want my kid to study with him, you know, or, or, you know, other, you know, um, parents of color, you know, they, they'll see, you know, this is a black led organization. And so that's powerful to them. So talk some about the business of key to change. Like people say nonprofits business to me is it, you still got to run about it like a business, right? So what is a business of key to change? Say more about that. What, of what people think about nonprofits. So I think a lot of people think nonprofits, like, you know, you don't, you don't have to make money, you know, money mm -hmm. just comes in, you know, you just, you know, you focus on your cause, you know, but, to, to really own diff is like the tax, the tax certification, right? I mean, right. You, you still got to pay people. Mm -hmm. You still got to, you know, different things. It's still a business at the end of the day, right? Yeah. I mean, it, it is, it, it is a business. It is recognized as a business by, you know, the IRS and by the state. Um, but it, it's, it's a mission driven business. And so with our organization, the decisions that we make from, a, you know, from a financial standpoint or from an operational standpoint, all are directly related to the mission, which is key for us. And would you say, since you're mission driven, is it, I would think, is it, be, is it easier or harder bringing people to work with you, right? Kind of think it'd be easier because you know they're all on the same mission, they all engage. Then it might be harder because that pool of talent might be smaller for you to pull in. For people who want to work with you or. You know, I, I think I'm not even going to put key to change in, a, in a, a box, but I'll just say that finding good people who are dedicated to their work, who are excellent at their work, who are, um, are going to do what they say they're going to do, they're going to show up on time, and, and they're going to execute at a high level is rare, right? In yeah. business, you know. Key to change is is really no exception. Finding really top level talent of people who are great is uh, tough because 
most people don't want to do a really great job. Yeah, I, of you course know? I have to agree with you. Yeah, you're right. That's just business, yeah. though. That's in any line of work from, you know, the the manager who has a construction company to a nonprofit organization to someone who is running a radio station. You're looking for the top talent, the people who are going to get the job done. Yeah. Um, and that's tough to find people who work from a real sense of integrity yeah. and, and, and equity and, um, and, and comfort in doing a great job. Yeah, I talked about this to someone on another podcast. I think too many people nowadays are like, I get paid 50000 a year. I'm only going to give $50,000 worth of work for it. They don't think about how can they add value. And what, is that, what, 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 is that, what does that look like, though? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, here's the thing. When you do a good job, people notice. Yes, they do. They do. It may not always go acknowledged, but people notice. And when you do a bad job, people don't want to work with you. I mean, perfect example, how many times have you gone through a coffee shop, Starbucks, and the customers have been so great through the drive through like, wow, this person is really great, right? You know, other times they're like, whoa, like what's going on here? Right. I mean, and that all, and it, it's all reflective back to the business. It's, it's, which is, it's, it's morals and it's values, you know? So like for myself, you know, I'm a really hard worker and I, I work, I will outwork you. You know, I learned that skill when I was in school um, because I went to very competitive schools. And um, while I wasn't always the most talented guy in the room, I worked the hardest. And so for me, um, I think, you know, when you work really hard and you work smart and you have um, a tireless work ethic, um, then you're going to be successful in whatever it is that you do. So change the subject just a little bit. Is there such thing as being too old to learn to play music? Like, can you be like over 40 and not learn piano or classical music? Sure. You can learn. Yeah. I mean, you're not going to play Carnegie Hall or anything yeah. like that. Yeah. But sure. I mean, I remember when I lived in Austin, uh, I had a, a student who was in his 70s, who was a surgeon. And he played violin, and he actually was not that bad. He was pretty good. I can see the transfer of like, surgeon to yeah. music. Well, he had played that. violin when he was, like, a teenager. And, um, and his, his daughter got him some violin lessons, and he enjoyed it so much. You know, she got it for him as a, as a birthday present, and he enjoyed it so much that he continued. And so each time that I go to Austin, I see him, and we have lunch and hang out. He's still practicing medicine and he's in his 80s now is there a different process in learning who say like play like you know rock guitar is there a different process to learning different types of music uh i'm sure there's a different process of of like the mechanics of learning the instrument but i think the process of learning you know the fundamentals is probably all somewhat the same you've got to know how to read the music you've got to understand rhythm you've got to have a good sense of pitch good sense of time you know those things are universal across all genres of music and all instruments so what's what's the difference between i'm gonna get this wrong like i heard like people like they 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 can read music some people can write music like is there i think one famous person i couldn't hear music or something like what's the difference some in all people that? can read music and um so there there's two different things there's people who know how to play by ear that's what we're talking right? about before, yeah. They play, play by, by ear. ear, but they can't actually read the music. Um, and then there are people who can read the music but can't play by ear. So, for instance, if you whistled something, somebody might be able to play what exactly what you whistled on their instrument. That's a person who can play by ear. A person who can't play by ear, you whistle it, they can't do that. Then there are some people who can do both. They can read and play by ear. So if you were like singing at some function, a lot of, a, a lot of black churches do this actually. If you start singing, the musician on the organ or on the piano might be able to immediately 
figure out what key you're in and then start playing with you. That's okay. called playing by ear. Okay. But a lot of classical musicians can't play by ear, believe it or not. Jazz musicians can, classical music cannot. And so if you start singing and you've got a classical musician on the piano, they're just going to be like, because there's no sheet music in front of them. Now, is one better than the other? Not really, in my opinion, because there are some people who can do both, right? Um, and I think for most classical musicians, we're not taught how to play by ear. We're taught how to master what's in front of us. So, which is the music. You played in like a lot of great places, great venues. What was the one place you were like, you're about to go on stage, you're on stage like, my life is so great. I can't believe I'm playing this location right now. This is really fantastic. I, I can't believe I'm here. Like, this is like, wow, like my life is really good right now. I mean, Carnegie Hall, you, you know, I remember the first time I went there, um, you know, the, uh, when they show you around, you know, she's like, oh yeah, and Yo-Yo Ma was here and, and, and Billie Holiday was here. And, you know, so you're like, wow, <laughs> whoa, you know. Um, I had that experience twice there. So the first time I um, was there with um, two other performers, um, Indra Thomas, who's a great soprano, and Mamie Fong, who's a pianist. And so the three of us had that moment to share together, which was like, wow. And, and we did kind of a chamber concert together, which was great. And then the second time I went as a soloist. So I was by myself with my accompanist. And I was like, oh my God, it's just me. Free, you know? Third time I went, I was like, all right, let's do this. Let's <laughs> rock and roll. Because I had already done it a couple of mm -hmm. times, so I knew what to expect. Um, so that's great. You know, and the chandeliers and the curtains, and you're just like, wow. Like, that's amazing. It was amazing. Um, the Louvre Museum, though. I could have to admit that it'd be pretty special. <sighs> Hands down. That was incredible. The most incredible three hours of my life. Hands down. Because I remember going there. My mom went with, uh, with me to the Louvre. And... I remember we were walking through like one of the back ways. And so, you know, they have at the Louvre, obviously there's all the, the art for the public, but then behind the scenes, there's a whole lot of art that the public doesn't see. And so the curator is like, oh yeah, this is like 14th century this. <laughs> and oh yeah, this is like 12th century over here. And I'm like, <laughs> I was like, oh my God, my biggest regret, I didn't take any pictures. Were you, you would have been allowed to take pictures? I probably could have just pulled out my phone and snapped something, you know what I mean? But yeah. I was just so mesmerized, you know? And this is where I'm just so thankful for memory, you know? Mm -hmm. Because um, that will always live with me. You know, just, I was like, wow, like, oh my God, on my way to the auditorium to, Get so, ready oh man, what a my, great experience. It, it, it really was. And the fact that my film, I got to perform, show my film, and lecture at the Louvre. <laughs> like, that was all of my talents being encompassed. To that moment right there. And that moment. You know, like Carnegie Hall, I went as an artist. You know, I performed there as a violinist. So as a musician, sure, that was a great experience. But the Louvre, like all of my talents as, you know, filmmaker, entrepreneur, musician, and scholar, that was the most orgasmic experience of my career, was being able to do that. It was, it was great. Man, my wish is everyone could have the moment like you did, right? If everyone could have the moment like that, the world would be a better place. Yeah. 
Yeah, it was great. And and I think what intensified it was everyone was speaking French, you know. <laughs> and and you know, my French is very, you know, rudimentary, but uh that was great because I was like, wow. And my mom was there. To experience with you. To experience it with and my mom was just like, what the hell is going on like, here? Like I didn't know my, I knew my boy was big, but I know my son was this big. Yeah, my mom, I, I you know, I should ask her. I should ask, because we haven't really talked about it. Like, I mean, that was four years ago, but I should ask her what she thought of that during that time, because... Um, She's going to be so proud of you. I mean, just... I'm sure she... Yeah, I, yeah, I know my mom's proud, but She's like... She's probably calling all her friends and stuff, you know? Yeah, I, she loved Paris. She really did, but we haven't, we haven't really actually talked about that, like, of... Like, what was that like for you as a parent seeing me go through that experience, mm -hmm. you know, because um, it just, it went by so fast, yeah. you know. Now, the cool thing is a friend of mine um, was debuting with the Paris Opera at the same time Whoa. I was at the Louvre. And so after he finished, we linked up. And we both celebrated together. I can't imagine that one hell of a celebration. That was fun. That was that was a lot of fun. Yeah. So, um, like when people like do public speak, even the great public speakers, they always say like, "I'm a great public speaker." Like Tony Robbins, them. But mm. I still get nervous. Do musicians get nervous for the? Good Are stage? you kidding? Absolutely. But you know why people get nervous? Because they care. Mm -hmm. What I tell my students is, if you're nervous. That's okay. It just means you want to do a great job and you, you care about what it is that you're doing. If you don't have any sort of nerves, that's when you should be scared. Yeah. For me personally, whenever I have to speak in public, if I'm nervous, I do pretty good. But if I'm nervous, I know I'm about to, about to bomb. It never fails, right? If I go to the yeah. speaks in front of people and I'm like, this is no big deal. I got it. I, right. I, I bomb big time. Well, the other part that most people don't talk about is if you're scared. If you're physically like, oh, my God, mm -hmm. oh, am I going to get through this? Mm -hmm. How are we going to get through this? That means you're not prepared. Yeah. I've been on all of those. I, I, I've, I have experienced all of those feelings. There have been moments in my career where I wasn't prepared. And I was like, oh, my God. <sighs> Let me just try to get through this. I'll never do this again. Right? And there are moments where I was nervous, like the Louvre. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, I can't believe I'm here, right? Um, but I did it, and you know, and I got a great review from it, which was great. Um, and then there have been moments where I haven't been nervous, or I've, I've probably been a little overly cocky, where I'm like, yeah, I got that, whatever. And then I bombed. So I, and I think that's just a human, just being human. You know, life goes in cycles. And um, I think that when you experience that cycle, you try not to experience too much of not being prepared or being scared and being more prepared. And so in order for that cycle of being prepared and doing a great job happens, in order for that to happen, you can't say yes to everything. Yes, that's a good lesson right there. Too many people say yes. You got to learn to say no. Sometimes. You've got to learn how to say no. Because if you say yes to every single thing, then you have no time for yourself. So, like, for instance, for myself, um, I know exactly what it is that I'm trying to do. I know what I want to accomplish. And I get a lot of great opportunities that come my way. But I can't say yes to them because I've got to also make time to prep for all the other things that I need to do. And if I don't have time for myself, to like downtime, recreation time, or study time, practice time, prep time, then I'm not going to be able to give the best version of myself. So in, in general, like, how do you do this? Like, for every minute of performance, you do, like, you say to yourself, I got to, 
practice for three minutes. I can prepare for four minutes per minute. Three minutes? Yeah. Like, what's the, what's the general Three, four rule? hours. Three, four hours for each minute? Okay. I mean, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, I don't practice nearly as much as I used to, but I'm not performing as much as I used mm -hmm. to either. So, but when I was performing, I mean, shoot, I might be on the violin seven, eight hours a day, depending on the concert or the venue, like Carnegie Hall, easily I was practicing seven, eight hours a day. Okay. Yeah. And how do you do that now? I mean, how, how much time do you invest in yourself now to, to keep on honing your craft and keep on staying at the level well, you're I, at? I think I've, you know, I've just reshaped my focus. So I'm not playing an enormous amount of concerts like I used to. I'm not doing any more world tours or anything. Um, I feel like that part of my career, like I've accomplished everything that I've wanted to do mm -hmm. with that. Do you think you ever go back to doing that in the future? I, you know, I still perform, but I'm just not going to do it on that scale or that level because I found something else that I'm really passionate mm -hmm. about. And that's key to change. And mm -hmm. key to change needs all of my attention mm -hmm. right now. I'm also in school too. So, you know, I've been um, doing this executive certificate program through Harvard Business School for mm -hmm. the last year. And so, you know, that, that's been really intense, you know. Can imagine. You know, being in school, running a nonprofit, teaching at the university, you know, and teaching within the, the not, you know, doing all the teaching. Like, there's not much room for performing as much as I used to. Um, and I feel like my world tour was kind of the climax of, of my performance career. How hard is it to get to your level? Like, for example, like, suppose there's 100 people who start out at the very bottom. Like, how many would it make to your level? Like, maybe one of them, two of them? I don't know how to get those skill, talent, perseverance. Well, I don't like to think of myself as, like, I'm way up here and everybody else is down here. I think, I think that your high level, a high level is what you define it to be, you know? Um, so I think that's first. Comparing yourself to other people, never a good look, um, especially as an artist, because there's always going to be someone who's better than you. There's always going to be someone who, um, who can play faster, slower, more beautiful, more there's always going to be someone who can do something more than you. So I think you have to first just kind of outline and, and determine what it is that you want for yourself. Once you've determined that, then I think you can figure out, okay, what is it that I'm trying to accomplish? So for myself, I had some real big goals for that. I wanted to um, obtain and, and, and do, um, and, and I think for me, that required a certain level of, of, well, not even a certain, but a high level of work ethic. So, and sacrifice. So sacrifice meaning not hanging out with your friends as much or not, um, not uh, you know, staying up as as late so or you know passing up some opportunities that you may really want to do right now because you really need to focus on this one thing it's so i think it's it's all about what where it is that you want to get to and go to i my work style is people would probably describe it as somewhat militant mm -hmm. you know um I, I've been known to be a really early riser. So I'm in bed, like sometimes if I'm really deep in a project, eight o'clock, 8.30, nine o'clock, up at four, mm -hmm. because it's quiet, I could get a lot of work done. Yeah, I think the stats show, studies show, you know, the earlier you get up, the more you work you get done, there's less distractions, et, yeah. cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I had a, um, a colleague of mine, um, named Dan Tripps, who used to teach at Seattle University with me, and he was up like 3.30 every morning. He was, Dan, <laughs> brilliant. He used to train um, swimmers for the Olympics. Like, and he like was, is incredibly published and, and 
um, and, and really big in the sports and exercise science world. He's now since retired. Mm -hmm. But I remember, like, I would see him in the morning, and he'd, oh, hi. Hi, Q. How you doing? And, and I'm like, man, it's like 6 o'clock in the morning. He's like, oh, yeah, I get up at 3. <laughs> what? Like, but, you know, and his wife would go to bed, too, at like 8, you know. Um, so I learned, I always surrounded myself around people who had kind of that same kind of work style or, or work ethic where, you know, very disciplined. And I think to answer your question, um, you define what excellence is on your terms. Mm -hmm. you, you define what it is that you really want to accomplish, how you think you can add value to other people. And then from there, um, you map out an outline of how to make that happen. So it's going to bed early or going to bed late, knowing how you work best. Mm -hmm. I think another thing is um, s sacrifice, knowing um, you can't say yes to everything and knowing that you also uh, cannot uh, do all the things that you want to do or see all the people you want to see. Third is you've got to... Uh, develop a sense of resilience because you're going to get knocked down a lot like what i've learned is no one's going to give you anything and if you're trying to be the best of the best the top of the top no one's just going to let you climb to the top people are going to pull you down people are going to talk about you and you've got to develop a sense of resilience and a sense of of um not worrying so much about what other people think think or say about you as you continue to climb because all that are distractions to knock you down and 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 so to get to my level or to get to any sort of high level you've got to have those things you've got to have a heart a, a heart of gold and also a heart somewhat of of steel because you're going to get rocked and, and you're going to get people who are jealous of you, who do not um, like you for whatever reason, who, who think they're better than you, who, who, whatever their agenda is, you can't let those things stop you from doing what it is that you want to do. And that's all based off of my experience, because there are a lot of other people who are much better violinists probably better teachers probably better entrepreneurs probably better filmmakers than i am but i ask smart questions i do my homework my research and um and i'm resilient and i know how to persevere and i'll outwork you why do you think so many people like like judge themselves on other people like like what they other people say other people's expectations and why do so many people like seem to lack resiliency nowadays you think because they're insecure. They're insecure and they don't know who they are. They don't know the value that they can bring to others because they're so busy focusing on other people. I did it for years. You know, I have colleagues that I'm like, God, they're so good. How come I'm not as good as them? You know, or God, man, they get everything. How come they're getting this? And they're getting these awards. They're getting these accolades. They're... I had to stop that shit. Excuse me. Like I had to just literally stop. And a couple of years, I had some life-changing events in my life that really caused me to pause and say, stop and just focus on who you are, who you are, you know, I, um, yeah, like I, I had moments where I was so fixated on what other people were doing, how they were playing, how they were living, what, you know, they bought this house, they got that car, they, their parents support them on that, that and they're able to travel here and, they, you know, and I'm like, wait, I have complete authority over my own life. And if I want those things, I can have those things for myself. And what I do, and, and whatever opportunities or whatever don't come my way or that I get passed by on, 
it wasn't meant for me anyway. Um, and I learned that lesson a couple of years ago. And that's when I really started to change my focus and um, focus more on who Quentin is and what Quentin wants rather than what I thought my teachers or my mentors or my friends or my parents or, or whoever I thought I should be for them, you know? Um, I had to really stop that. I think a lot of people mess up too. Though. A lot of people are like, you know, I'm 25, I'm 30, I'm 35. I don't have a house. I don't have this, have that. Not realizing even if you're 40 years old, so you got like probably like 40 years of life left, right? You still have a lot of time left to accomplish things, right? You don't have to do it right now. And it says, you know, your friend that made it, quote unquote, made it at 25, maybe your time to make it even better is like 35, 40, right? We get but, but what is making it? That's where, yeah, good point, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, if we're going by standards, okay, I made it by going to college. Yeah. I made it by going to Xavier. Okay, I made it by going to North Carolina School of the Arts. Did I make it? Okay, yeah. I you got a master's put, degree. You keep on making it right. Right. You keep making what it is that you want. You know, so I, like I was in school for 11 years. 11 years. So, okay, after I, I finished school, I made it. I got a doctorate. You can't go any higher than a doctorate, <laughs> right? So I made it. Does the education stop? I'm back in school now. No, <laughs> it doesn't. I got a job at a university. I made it, right? Because I'm there. But then there are levels there. You have to get tenure. I got tenure. So I'm a, now an associate professor. I made it, right? You know, I've played concerts literally around the world. I've made it, right? It's all what you make it to be. No one ever makes it. You're continuously making it. Great point. You're continuously making it. So I've made it a zillion times. But it hasn't come without lots of disappointments and failures and mistakes. God, I've made a zillion. I've made more mistakes than I have accomplishments. You know what I mean? So like the world tour, for instance, I stopped counting literally after 32 of the rejections that I got from film festivals, from presenters, from venues, from, you know what I'm saying? Like, I stopped, I literally stopped counting after 32 because I was just like, this is ridiculous. Because one day I would be happy, the next day I'm in tears or I'm upset or I'm like, I quit. Like, but I'm continuously making it. So you never make it, you're just continuing in the flow of creating and making what it is that you want for yourself. So and that's why my career continues right. to go like this. Is that more that you're, you're, you're self-driven, you have focus, and you want to do better and have, add value versus some people, like, they, they make a go and they're like, they stop? Is it something internal to people? or I think it's totally internal. I, I think it's totally internal as to – but, again, it's, it's knowing who you are and what it is that you want to do and the impact you want to have on people. And when you're clear about that, then all the outside noise and all the outside people and stuff who say all sorts of crazy shit about you or whatever doesn't even matter because you know who you are. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, like, my work style is, to a lot of people, militant and tough. And, but it works for me. It may not work for other people, and that's okay. That's not going to stop me from doing what I'm going to do. You don't have to like me or subscribe to what I do. Do you? You know what I'm saying? But you're not going to hinder me from doing what I do. I don't care that you don't like what I do. Do you, you know? ever see yourself retiring? Uh, one day. Do you one see? Day. I, don't, I don't see that. I don't see you retiring. I, I see mean, you like, I'm too young to yeah. retire right now, you know, but. but I see you like, see you like, I see you doing something you love until like, you know, like in text we call it, um, What's it called? Ten toes up. Like, like you're working to your ten toes up, right? Yeah, I mean... I, like, I don't see you, like, being on a rocket chair or, like, chilling out. I, just, I see you doing something. Eventually, I will. Eventually, I will. But, I no, there's too many things that I'm, I want to do right now and too many things that I want to accomplish in my life. And um, so, no, okay. not right now. 
Next, let's talk about skill versus passion versus either community or supported community, right? So, mm-hmm. so skill, you know, the skill to do it, the passion, love for it, and the supported community, like, you know, like, you might have the great skill, great passion, but like, if your parents don't support you, your community don't support you, do you need all three things at the same level? Can you do one or without? Like, like, for example, I, I have a passion for basketball, right? I have no mm-hmm. skill, right? Mm-hmm. So how does all three combine? In your, in your well, life? passion, I, I think y- you can be passionate about something, but just because your passion doesn't, to your point, doesn't mean that you're actually good at it or that you should pursue that as a business or that um, it should be an influence for other people. So no, I, I, I think skill is really important. Um, regarding skill, like for instance, you know, I've at least heard this and I'm sure you have too, like there's no such thing as a dumb question. I disagree. I wholeheartedly disagree with that because, well, I should say I disagree with that when it comes to business. Mm-hmm. So, for instance, if you are trying to pitch something to me or um, you want to work with me and you don't know a lot about the industry, my industry, or you don't have um, skills, or if you're trying to get me to invest in something in you and I'm asking you questions, or you're asking me questions, your questions, did, at least from, in, from my point of view, the questions you ask show me, demonstrate to me how prepared you are. Mm-hmm. It shows me. Have you done your homework? And if you haven't done your homework, I'm not interested in working with you. Mm-hmm. Very good point. You know what I mean? Yeah, I do. So if you're asking me questions like, well, what is a violin? So who's your audience? Right. Like what types of people listen to classical music and you're trying to work with me? No, 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 no. You haven't done your homework, which means you're not serious, which means you're going to waste time and time is money. And I'm not interested in that. So I think that when you're in situations, you've got to be skilled. You can can be passionate all you want, but you've got to have skill in in the sense of of understanding what it means to be prepared, what it means to um, be diligent, um, knowing your industry, knowing your product, knowing what it is that you're trying to accomplish and do so that... uh, so that you know you can be competitive because like i said earlier no one's just going to hand it to you no one's just going to give it to you if you don't know more than what other anyone else in your field knows you're done you're toast yeah you're so, toast like, I, i've been in pitch competitions for my startup and and people ask other other business owners who's your competition i don't have none or i don't know like are you kidding me right now like that's impossible right it's totally impossible it's totally impossible so when people say you should follow your path for your business. I'm guessing you disagree with that statement. I agree that you should be passionate about the content of your business, but you need to be skilled at, um, you need to be very skilled at more of the content of what it is that you're doing. And depending on what level you're trying to get to, You've got to make sure you know more than everybody else. How how do you take care of yourself? We talked about that earlier. Like, how do you take care of your wellness? How do you make sure you're like, you know, fine tuned every day? How do you do that? You have a you meditate. You have a ritual. I do. do. I med I meditate every night actually um, before I go to bed. Um, so I, I meditate. I write a lot, um, and uh, I have a very small circle of friends mm-hmm. and family of support. Is I think it that's true, really important. Is it true that how I word this right? The more successful you become, the less your like the tight your circle becomes. The smaller your circle yeah. becomes. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. I think so. Why do you think that is? This because like there's not enough people. How to word this? Is it because not but not enough people on your level or like you, you get more successful and you got to leave people behind? Like you always you're like you're always friends with people. They're not. Well, like, well, the, the thing is, is that 
I mean, I believe in the universe and the law of attraction. I believe that as you pursue what it is that you're trying to do, that you're you're basically a sum of of your community. Mm-hmm. So you're a sum of of the types of people that you hang like around. The top five five people hanging around with you're like them. Yeah, so to speak. yeah. So people as people start to fall off, you know. Um, so like for instance, for me, like. You know, a year ago, I enrolled in this program at at Harvard Business School, and a lot of people fell off because they don't understand what my hustle is and what I'm trying to do. And that's totally fine. You know, we'll pick up where we left off, you know, but later, if 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 that time happens, but right now, I'm all about goals and I'm trying I got a lot of things I'm trying to accomplish. And so, in order for me to keep my iron sharp, I've got to be in school and I've got to be grinding. So naturally, a lot of people have just kind of fallen off and that's, that's totally okay. Let's talk about this. Um, I, always t- I always tell young people this, right? Like, I'm, I'm not young, right? And like a lot of people, like they think I'm 20, 30, like I'm telling, I'm in my 50s. Like I still have to focus on fire, right? It's not going away. Like when I'm, I was 25, like, man, I got to do what I got to do now because when I'm old, quote, old, I'll be in the rock, rocking chair, you know, no focus, no fire, but I have a lot of fire now. Can you talk about like never losing a fire, at least not yet anyway? Or never well, I think that again, like I was saying, life goes in cycles. And so, you know, sometimes your flame, you know, your flame never goes out, but it certainly can get really low. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it's really bright. Other times it's not. That's just a circle of life. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I think who you surround yourself around can keep that light fired up, even if it's at a low, um, if it's it's burning low, the people you surround yourself around will help you continue to keep it burning. How do you, for your for key to change, how do you like recruit students? How do you do that? Like, do you have like a, like you we just recruit go to through local, the schools. The schools, okay. We recruit through the schools, we recruit on social media. Mm-hmm. Um, what's the process to apply? You just apply. You go to the, the application and Do they you, have to like, like give you a video of like a recital or anything like hmm. that, or nope. Just, they have, they have like they, they just, just want come to, want in to learn. and and we assess them once they've signed up. We assess them. Yeah. Has there ever been times where you had like reject a potential candidate for some reason? We've never turned away anyone. Okay. Mm-mm. And 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 we don't. We we accept all students for where they are. What happens, like, you know, you get a student and, like, after, we'll say, six months, they make no improvements, they're not that good. That hasn't happened. Hasn't happened yet? Okay. Mm-hmm. That's a testament to how you'll teach soon. We teach at a very high level at Key to Change. We have not had any students in our program who came away after six months who didn't make any progress. If they, no, we've never had a kid who did that. Mm-mm. Can you talk about some career options for artists? Like, do they, you become a music, you know, you become an artist, do you like sure. play for sympathy? Do you go teach? What's, what's some career options? Sure. Um, as as a artist, I mean, if, if you want to stay in the arts, there are things like um, playing in the symphony, you know, but I should preface this by saying that playing, Getting a job in the major symphony orchestra is harder than getting into the NFL and the NBA combined. And on top of that, I would say in the NFL, you probably you know have a lot of job change, right? But I'm guessing you're the symphony, you suppose you get a symphony at 30 years old, you probably stay in that slot like 20, 30 years, right? Right. The job right. change over is probably right. way, way, way but it's, lower. It's tough. It's tough. And um, but there's lots of things that you can do. Some people become CEOs of symphonies, some people actually start their own chamber music groups and um and be you know run their own groups that way and they book their own concerts some people become booking agents some people become education directors or teach in public schools or become arrangers like i have a very good friend she um arranges music for all the hip-hop shows and so she's been on bet and she played uh for kobe bryant's funeral and and like she's there's so many different things that you can do as an artist and um you know so you you can you can build whatever it is that you want to do 
but to talk about the business of being an artist. Like you hear the term starving artist, right? I think a lot of artists, or you correct me wrong, a lot of artists are like, they love the music, love the passion, but they don't take care of like, you know, the business part. Like they'll, they'll yeah, they don't understand. Yeah. That. They're like, they'll do a concert and get cheated out by the, you know, the promoter, you know, yeah. How, they, how do we, how do you teach people that? Make sure well, they make I think there's this. a couple things. You've got to understand accounting. You've got to understand contracts. You've got to understand um, numbers. And you've got to understand your, your worth and your value. That's not just artists. That's entrepreneurs. That's creatives. That's everyone. How much that, you know, like you said, you spend like you know, eight hours a day. How much that, you know, like an artist will say, hey, I need $1,000 for this. And the, while well, you only pay an hour, that's $100. And the artist says, well, no, you pay me for all the time I practice too, right? Yeah, you're paying for, or you're paying for the brand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great point too. The brand you're too. You're paying for the brand. You're paying for the experience. Yeah. So they do they teach that in music school? No, no. I know they don't teach lawyers business. They don't teach doctors business. You know, like no. I mean, they they don't teach you any of that that stuff. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. How many artists do you think are out there like struggling who shouldn't be struggling because of that? I would say a large percentage of students or art students of artists and entrepreneurs are struggling because of that. So I guess we've got to make a change to the school system, which probably won't be happening those time soon. Uh, or is that the individual's responsibility to say, you know, you know, I, I go back and forth on this because there most schools do teach it. It's just not within the it's, it's not required. It's not required. <laughs> So like, for instance, when I was an undergrad, when I was at North Carolina School of the Arts, um, I was able to take classes at Wake Forest University. So I took creative writing with Maya Angelou, actually. Oh, wow. Um, at, at Wake Forest, but I had to seek not, that not out. Not too shabby of an instructor you had. <laughs> <laughs> you can be surprised. Uh, but uh, I was... So within the UNC system, they had a consortium between Wake Forest, Winston-Salem State University, and North Carolina School of the Arts. And so you could take classes at those other schools. And so I did, but I sought that out on my own. You know, when I was in Boston, it was kind of the same thing. Like there were classes that were outside of my master's degree that I took. And when I got to University of Texas, it was totally the same thing. I remember taking a class on how to do a PowerPoint. Like it was a class on Excel and in Microsoft Word. Now this was in the you know um, late two thousand or mid two thousands. You know when that sort of stuff was really starting to come. You know to be like I and I took a couple of like business classes at. Um, University of Texas because I wanted to know so but I sought that stuff out it wasn't necessarily so my again, curriculum. more internal driven absolutely absolutely and and it goes back to my earlier point which is your work ethic and what it is your skill of you knowing more than others so if you want to make money if you want to negotiate um, deals for yourself, then you've got to understand the language of business. And if you don't understand the language of business, you're screwed. Yes. And a lot of people don't know that. And now more than ever, there's so many online programs and so many that are tutorials free. that are for free. So it's like, if you don't know whose fault is it, it's yours. Is there any historical historical musical figure you would like to spend time with, whether they're living now or, or in the past, that you're like, man, I should have hang out with this guy or, or girl for historical a day? Historical figure from the past. Could be a musical, just historical, any, any person in general. If I were... It's interesting because I think if I could choose any superpower, it would be to be a time traveler. Mm -hmm. If there were one person that I would want to meet and I could actually bring them, if I could travel back in time to meet them and then bring, have that person 
come to 2020, mm-hmm. it would be George Washington. Okay. Because he was the first president of the United States. Mm-hmm. And the way the government and just politics has changed so much Mm -hmm. from when our founding fathers, you know, created the United States of America. And so I would, I would want to meet George Washington and have a conversation with him and say, I want you to travel with me to 2020 so that you can see what is happening and how is this the country you want? Because this is technically your legacy. Yeah, it is. You're right. It's your legacy. So if I could just show you around for a week, so that you could see what's happening in this country, maybe that will help you determine Mm -hmm. how laws, how government, how we the people should function in this new country that you now. That you founded and you you know. Founded. Yeah, that's a great point. That's who I would want to meet. Cool. Because he was the beginning and this is his legacy it is you're right i never thought about that yeah you're right i mean talk he's, about- he's the first because remember mm-hmm. we were talking earlier about who's at the top mm-hmm. right well at the top of government if we're looking at this from a historical lens the very top of government is george washington mm-hmm. and this is his legacy I mean, you were talking about second, third order effects. His decision had like a thousand millionth order effects. Affected everybody. So that's why I'm saying you've got to know who you are mm-hmm. because your actions leave a lasting impression and a lasting leg. It's a legacy. Your legacy is what you pass on to others. Yes. So like my Angelo, I know her as a teacher. You know her as what, a writer, poet, Mm -hmm. you know? I just know her as my old professor. But the legacy she left was different for so many different types of people. It's different for me than it is for you. You know what I'm saying? But nevertheless, she left a legacy. We talked about this a little bit before, but can you talk about the challenges and opportunities for entrepreneurs now? with COVID. I think some entrepreneurs, I mean, I think some of them have given up too fast, you know, oh, COVID knocked on the business out. I think it's a great opportunity for them too. Do you know who Clay Christensen is? No. He... <clears throat> oh, was he the music music singer? No, 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 no. Clay Not Christensen him. is, um, was, because he just recently passed away, but he was, he's considered kind of the top scholar of of innovation and disruption. Okay. We are living in times where we as entrepreneurs can either innovate or fail and die. I personally feel like COVID is, I've been waiting for an opportunity like this. You know, I'm not now, has COVID been, um, has it been challenging? Absolutely, you know, challenging. But there's always challenges, right? There's always challenges, but it's all in how you respond to it. And I think for me, like this, moment has been great for me because it's been able to really show what I can do as an entrepreneur, as a thought leader, as someone who really is passionate and cares about business, all in how you respond. And so what I would say to entrepreneurs is um, Clay Christensen talks about disruption and how disruption is an opportunity for us 
um, as entrepreneurs to either, again, innovate, adapt, or die. Mm -hmm. and, and I think innovation right now is at an all-time high for people to really figure out who can create the most value for people. Whoever does that wins. Mm -hmm. Whoever can adapt to the current situation right now of COVID wins. Whoever cannot dies. And so right now in our country, more specifically entrepreneurs, there's a lot of entrepreneurs who flex, who are like, I've got this, I've got that. I do this, I do that. Okay, show me now. <laughs> yeah, Isn't that, yeah show me right. now. Yeah. There's a lot of people who just talk, 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 but there's no action behind what it is that they're doing. Key to change, we didn't close our doors. We didn't stop. Everything has continued to go like this. In the middle of a pandemic, we were able to adapt and change to online and still serve and serve more kids. What's your vision for key to change? Is it to have like a key to change chapter in each big city, or what's this like to have a certain Too percentage? early to say. Too I early? don't okay. know. Too I don't. Early. You know, right now our focus is to provide the highest quality of music instruction we can to students. How do you like how to work for this? Like, how do you bring? How do you find your music teachers? Is there just close friends of you, like previous relationships? Can somebody send you an email? Hey, I like what you're doing. I want to be involved. I want to help you out. Um, so our guest artists who we we invite in, we um we invite the top of the top of of guest artists, um, to come in. Um, and so if people are interested in you know coming in and want to do a guest master class, we're open to that. Um, generally we seek them out. Okay. Um, you know because they come from you know really respected institutions you know so um and and they have a track record of high success mm -hmm. so like this season um which starts this fall like we have a violinist from uh um chamber music at lincoln center who's coming you know we've oh. got a professor from the university of texas we've got a professor from florida international university you know, we've got um, someone from Seattle Symphony coming in. Like, we, I mean, it's really high level people that we have. So, um, you know, we have a process of how we evaluate and invite people to come in to work with us. So I know you focus on sixth graders. Uh, six through 12. Six through 12. Yeah. Is a difference between teaching someone with say 10th grade versus someone in college or elementary or? Well, uh, but college, yes. Okay. Yeah. So just diff diff different methods then? Yeah, and, and different age, you know, different maturity. You know, I think teaching middle school students is always great because it's an opportunity to kind of get them to kind of help shape their minds. They're just, mm -hmm. they're learning for the first time really what responsibility is. Mm -hmm. They're learning what accountability is. So they're at that age where you can really direct them in a positive way um, to start to become more accountable for their actions. Uh, high school, of course, is great because each year they're peeling off a new layer of um, what it means to uh, grow as a, a mid to late adolescent into young adulthood. And that's always really beautiful. College students, um, you know, college students are interesting. They're fun. They're fun. But a lot of them, when they come to college, they just want to have fun. Yeah. And um, which is no problem because God knows I had a lot of fun <laughs> in college. But, uh, you know, you, you get much more of a mixed bag of people who are really interested in, in be becoming, you know, the best that they can be. Some people are there just because you know, of societal pressures or their parents or whatever. Mom and dad went to this college. I have to go to this college. I've got to go or because of religion or whatever, you know. Um, there's a variety of reasons why kids sign up and go to college. I personally feel like, huh, 
I would say at least 40% of kids should not be in college, if not higher. They should do a trade. Yeah, I agree with that. Definitely. There's nothing wrong with it. There's no, And I'm saying this as a college professor. I'm saying this. Like, I believe that more students should go to community college and more students should um, pick up trades. I think there's a huge lack in the trade industry. Um, and I think that at least 40% of the students that I have seen through my career had no business being in college and would probably be more successful if they actually went to trade school. Yeah. I remember there was a meme a long time ago. It was like, have one person, you know, liberal arts degree, you know, $100,000 student loans, making $40,000 a year. Other one was like, you know, a plumber making 80000 no student loans. I said, who's the dummy? Like, who's like, bro, you know, who? See, I don't know if I agree with the, who's the dummy per se, right? Because it is pushed that you should go to college. Mm -hmm. And the reality is, yeah, college is. It's a good experience. It's right? a good experience. You know, you go for a number of reasons. Um, but once you figured out who you are. Yeah. Then it should become pretty clear what you should be doing. Yeah. And a lot of kids, unfortunately, when they go to college, just don't know who they are. Mm -hmm. And that's why they're there. But if they know who they are, they wouldn't be there. They'd be in a trade school or they'd be getting some sort of, of certificate, you know, to help make this world better. Yes. So I don't think it's, it's people are dumb. I just think that there are a lot of misinformed parents and really misinformed students. I knew exactly as the moment I knew that I wanted to go into music, mm -hmm. there was nothing else you could do to stop me. It was nothing. I left Xavier University at the end of my junior year. And, and, and like you said before, that had to be a tough decision. All your friends there, but you knew what you wanted to do in your life. And I had a year left to, until I graduated. Mm -hmm. So I knew that was what I was going to do. And I can't tell you the number of people, especially in undergrad, who told me you'll never make it. I had a professor in undergrad who was very vocal about me dropping music and would tell me you're wasting your time. There's no path for you in music. None. Like you'll become maybe a good elementary school music teacher. But yeah. he didn't see the vision for me, yeah. but I did. I saw it for myself. And when you know better, you do better. For your students at Key Chase, how involved do you get with their personal lives? Like, like a student comes and you tell me they don't have support, they need back at home, or they're from a bad situation. How involved do y'all get in, in those kind of things, if at all? Um, I don't, I don't think we get too involved with kids' situations. I think it's all on a personal basis. Mm -hmm. You know, what we do is really just try to provide a safe and caring community for them for the time so, they're with you that's right okay that's right that's right and that's what sometimes that's all the kids need right just that safe place and like be supportive they and yeah they just want to know that someone cares about them and and that's another reason why i think we're doing so great because during covid a lot of people just dropped and disappeared mm -hmm. and gave up a lot you know even in, in the school not all teachers were teaching. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so what's, what message does that send to kids? That they're so overwhelmed, they can't pull themselves together to teach. Some of them couldn't. You know, for whatever reasons they were, you know, whatever their circumstances were, they weren't able to do it. And kids suffered. Key to change was not one of them. So that became our competitive advantage. We showed up. And, and when we showed... And, and when Key to Change showed up in the, at, at the beginning of a global health crisis, you think you as a parent are going to pull your kid out no. of that program? No. When you've got a teacher who's there on time, ready to go twice a week to teach your kid or three times a week, you're going to make sure your kid is there yes, and are. engaged. So our numbers went way up. 
because now we're reliable. We're really reliable. Mm -hmm. We're reliable. We're dependent. You can depend on us in a, in, in a crisis. And we care about you. Yeah. And it and definitely shows. Think, and it shows. And, and that with business, you've got to make sure that people know you care. Mm -hmm. That's the biggest thing. I think a lot of businesses don't get, you know, they don't get it. They don't get it that we care. We care. From your point of view, what makes someone a good entrepreneur? Is there certain characteristics that have focus, internal drive? What, what is it? Focus, internal drive, um, determination, resilience, mm -hmm. perseverance, knowledge, passion. Um, authority. That's a good one. Yeah, that's a good one. That's very good you one. can't be a uh, meek. Uh, unsure entrepreneur. Yeah, that's that's the. Uh, I've never. No one's ever said that before. That's a good one. One though. You gotta have authority. That's mm -hmm. a good one. So you're doing a lot, right? I mean, your your day's busy. You're doing a lot. You know, how do you day to day decide what, what to focus on? Do you have a calendar? Mm -hmm. You just wing it. You like to wake up. Oh day, God! Like, I like, know. Like, I can't. You, wing what, do you, it. what do you do? Um, I'm I'm a planner. Mm -hmm. Generally, a year in advance. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's a different level right there. <laughs> I learned it from my professor at University of Texas at Austin. Everything is planned a year in advance. Whoa. So all of next year is already planned. That's impressive. I don't, is it impressive or is it just the right thing to do? Yeah, I think it's both. So how much is that? Is it OCD then, like plan a year in advance? I mean, is it OCD to have your, you know, projects and stuff planned out? Like, no, probably not. I mean, it's just something that you it's do. It's very smart. It's, I mean, it's responsible. It's I very think. smart, responsible. I mean, I mean. Yeah. So you have a schedule plan that you're out. How much does that change over the course of time? Like 80%, uh, 70%, 20%, 30%. 30 you know, so I mean. The is pretty locked in. Pretty much, okay. and it, and remember, I said this earlier that it's it's the decisions that we make are all determined by the mission mm -hmm. of what it is that we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we plan way far advance mm -hmm. a year. Um, so like I'm already working on uh, twenty twenty one twenty two now. You know, of like setting out the blueprint of like what it is that I want to do. So yeah, it's. So I'm guessing it's, it's going to take like a life change, event to change the schedule because we're like like someone. Like you have yeah, to I mean, COVID your, didn't. Yeah. The COVID didn't really like change you anything. Invite, you have to get invited to a wedding or something like that, or. I mean, yeah. Now, I'm I'm just talking about my work, yeah, yeah. right? But but my personal, yeah. I mean, that stuff, you know, is much more flexible. You know, like you know, if my brother comes or, or family member or something like that comes, then yeah, that's, that's totally fine. But as far as business is concerned, like, you know, I knew like, for instance, I signed up, you know, I, I went back to school. So I've been in this program at Harvard for over a year. So I'm like, okay, school work's got to come first. I can't do, um, I can't take on all these extra projects because my schoolwork has got to come because, mm -hmm. you know, Harvard, I mean, the workload is enormous. So <laughs> I can't, I can't say yes to a bunch of stuff. So if it's not key to change related, or if it's not related to my university, the answer is no. And I had to do that. Now, of course, I finish in November. Mm -hmm. And so then I can start to take on a few more things, but I've had to say no to a lot of stuff. Well, the things you said no to in the past, or, you know, go back to them in the future. Hey, I can, I can get yeah, back to you now. Cause no, no, ne doesn't mean never. It just means not right now. So for your schedule, like some entrepreneurs, they'll like work hundred hours a week, seven days a week. Some would like take like work three day, three weeks, take a week off. What do you do personally? Like, how do you do that? Um, well, I never teach on weekends. Never. Um, 
I teach, you know, during the week only because that's my work. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and people are like, well, how come you don't teach on the weekends? Because I need my weekends because I'm human and you can have me during the week, but on the weekends, they're mine. So um, I think that's first. I think secondly is um, uh, I have a, a schedule of, of like when I you know work out or when I have lunch, I take a nap every day. People don't realize how important that is, right? Dude, I do it every day. I, I, I take a nap every day, even if it's 30 minutes mm-hmm. or an hour, generally an hour. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, I, I schedule in nap time. That's so important. Like, yeah, those yeah. naps are like great. Yeah. And I don't, um, I mean, I work. I don't know how much I work. 70 hours, maybe. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I, I stopped keeping track. Mm-hmm. So I forgot to ask you this during pre talk, but is there any like gift or discount you want to give away? Any gift? Yeah. Some people do, some people don't. Some people no. have their time. Some people like do whatever, you know? No. Okay. I feel like I've given some gems. I've you dropped definitely give good, good value. Yeah. <laughs> definitely. Um, can you share your social media for yourself and key to change so people can reach out to you? Sure. So on Facebook, it's uh, just Quentin Morris. And on Instagram, it's QI Morris. And I'm on LinkedIn, Quentin Morris. So. Do you have a favorite social media platform as an artist? Or do you think it's the social media, the social media platform the artist should be on all the time? Like maybe do Instagram stories or videos? Yeah, or whatever, I or? do Instagram. I do. I think every artist is it's individual. I'm not a social media influencer mm-hmm. by any means. And I got to be honest with you. Some of those social media influencers are suspect. And right? they're, not, they're not really influenced anything, right? I mean, yeah. Like I... Some of the people that I do business with and that I see and that I know are grinding and and killing it, they don't have 10,000, 20,000 mm-hmm. followers. I know one person who has 500,000 followers. He's verified mm-hmm. on Instagram, mm-hmm. okay? This young man. Uh, I'm not going to say who it is, but he, I feel sorry for him because I think he thought that by getting verified Mm -hmm. that, and having all these followers that he was going to make all this money. Mm -hmm. A couple months ago, he was online basically lamenting about how he didn't have any money. Mm -hmm. And he was basically begging people for gigs. Mm-hmm. He's a musician. And my heart just kind of went out to him. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because I think there's this false perception that, oh, if you have a whole bunch of followers that people are going to, you know, you're going to make all this money. You have to convert the followers to business, right? Please. Like, so I, I'm always weary of people like that. Um, Cause like, People who've invested in my organization, they're either not on social media or they've got 200 people that follow them or whatever. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I just, not that I diss social media at all because I do enjoy it and I do enjoy the connection with people mm-hmm. that it creates, but I'm not looking at that as my major social platform. And I think that there's, a, again, COVID. Mm-hmm is exposing a lot of people. Like, if you're going to tell me, hey, I can help you make $50,000, well, okay, that's great. But if you live in an apartment and you're going to try to teach me how to make $50,000 and you don't own your place, I'm not interested in hearing anything you have to say. You know what I'm saying? Or if you don't have... Um, if you're not building your wealth, I'm not, I'm not interested in anything you got to say. There's a lot of people who are faking it. And, um, 
like I said, the people I know who are grinding, who are working, they're not big social media influencers. Okay. They're not. How quickly or how long does it take for you to see someone who has like true, like great true music talent? Is it pretty quick for you to see it or recognize it? Or Yeah, I think that there's, again, that natural talent that we were talking about earlier. I think that that, that is that's pretty coherent that's, that's like jumps out at you yeah 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 and like when you see that do you just like try to mention them more or you try to point them in the right direction yeah like, and you, and and identify their skills that that are deficient and try to and, show them hey these are the options for you yeah like, these are these are the skills that you need to work on or these are this is what's going to help you become a better artist or just a better person like like i said i think everyone has a talent at something mm -hmm. but you need the skills to be able to support the talent so like, for instance, myself, there are a lot of people in, you know, when, especially when I was in school, who are much more talented than I was, mm -hmm. who had much more skill than I had. So I had to work five times as hard mm -hmm. just so that my talent could be highlighted through my skill. I didn't have the skill to match my talent. How, so I had to work at it. How rare do you think, how rare, rare do you think this is? Like, you know, for, say Michael Jordan, Michael Jordan had great talent, a great work ethic, right? He combined the two, like be really great. He's unstoppable. Like how many people like, you know, have actually don't have both of them, right? How is that so rare? Like how do you come people don't mess it together? A lot of people don't know what they're talented at. So then they don't know what skills to okay. work on with that. You know, they don't know. Great point. Um, so Dr. Quentin Morris, thank yeah. you for being here today. We're coming to the end of our talk. Yeah. Can you give us any advice or wisdom or anything you want to talk about? I, I, you know, I appreciate being on here. I would just say to your listeners, um, your followers, that um, we're in a great moment in our country and in the world to create something that could be a value to lots of different people. And I would say that I would encourage people not to give up. Um, to keep going and um, to persevere through these hard times. They are definitely challenging and, and tough, but this is something that we all can overcome and we can all uh, be better for it. Dr. Morris, thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. To our listeners, thank you for your time as well. Remember to be great every day.